Sancho Rose Boys. This is your co-host, Tim Amatuli. And I'm Chris Cote. And they said it couldn't be done, Tim. They said Chris wouldn't read a 600-page literary novel for a bit for one episode of this podcast. But folks, I did it. I read the entire book. It did take me a week and a half extension yeah, did, did <laughs> on our recording deadline. Did we take a few deadline. weeks off secretly to finish reading this book? Maybe. Uh, maybe. But I did actually do it. Finished it yesterday. Folks, <laughs> I did it. I want to say one thing in regards to the book and the movie before we get into it. Every weird little thing that made you confused about this movie is indeed a reference to the book. <laughs> That's probably the number one question people have, and the answer is yes. Uh, but let's go ah, into the, the movie itself. Okay, now. okay, yes. We are covering Kurosawa's 1951 follow-up to Rashomon, his first ever epic, his film of epic length, The Idiot, based on the novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Yep, Dostoevsky's critically acclaimed, kind of amazing super long famous novel from 1869 mm, yeah. and kurosawa was like what if i yeah, made a movie? As, as dry as the desert and i would assume as cold as siberia <laughs> actually one weird uh okay we'll start off with differences between the book and the movie you know the entire second half of the movie that was sure. in a blizzard that all takes place during summer <laughs> in the book and I was Damn like, why, why is it like pitch winter? And I was like, it's supposed to be summer. They constantly talk in the book about how nice it is outside. <laughs> They're like, oh man, it's so nice. No one ever <laughs> says that here. <laughs> yeah. In the opening, like it's supposed to be cold. And then literally the rest of the book is in pleasant, <laughs> nice weather. But oh well, <laughs> uh, Kurosawa will do what he will. Another thing, I want to preempt any capricious fans. I read the book once. I did my best. If I get anything wrong about it, uh, don't email me. <laughs> don't talk to me. But I think I, I got a pretty yeah, good grasp you, of it. you have a better grasp of it than me. I've never read it. By design, I don't read. I only read Donald Ritchie's book and Akira Kurosawa's autobiography, which ended after Rashomon. Despite writing his autobiography in the 80s, he stops his recollection of his life after Rashomon. But he does have a little note about the idiot at the very end of the Rashomon chapter, where a he just line. says, This idiot was ruinous. And folks, he was yeah. right. <laughs> Making this film, he actually reflects on it kind of nicely in a weird way because he was working through a lot of stuff. The Idiot is like his favorite book. Fyodor Dostoevsky is like his favorite author. He loves Russian literature, as we've talked about. But the mm -hmm. studio hated this movie and they cut it up so much. What we're seeing is a super compromised vision. All of this other footage was lost, and he went back to Shochku years later to try and find it in their archives to see if he could restore his cut of the idiot. That is like the thing that he wanted the most in his life, and it just wasn't possible. This was initially a two-part film that was going to run 265 minutes, and they cut about 100 minutes out of this movie. And as you can imagine, it's pretty tough to cut 100 minutes out of a story. Yeah, 100 they minutes is longer than most of the movies that he's made prior to this. As someone who's read the book, it shows. Despite the fact that it tries so desperately to be faithful to the book, there is a lot from the book that is just Why totally missing. Why don't you give missing. us a little book report on The Idiot? Okay, so this is my first time reading a Russian literary novel, particularly one by a long one by Fyodor Dostoevsky. I've heard good things about it, and I read it, and I will say, I really enjoyed it. I'm not, you know, the best reader, but I'm a regular guy who could manage my way through it. And it was a really good book. It was really enjoyable the whole way through. I remember telling Tim the day I opened it, I was like, that was really funny. All these characters are really cool, and like I'm actually laughing as I read this book, and I'm that really enjoying it. That was a shock it. to me, to, to get a call about the idiot and be like, oh no, he can he not yeah. do it? Has he, has he already been repulsed by it? And no, it's like, this book is funny? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's good. And as it goes on, it also gets like pretty deep in a way that the movie does <laughs> reflect. Yeah, it is a book that's about a lot more than just the idiot himself. Uh, famously, it's about Dostoevsky trying to put the Christian ideal of love through the crucible of Russian society, which just means he created this character, the idiot, who's not actually an idiot. He's just a very kind-hearted, naive oh, man. Oh, who's I, actually I, I, supposed I have to be... a title card from the movie that could explain the exact thesis of his work, if you'd like. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, they say it in the movie, which is nuts. But it's about this intelligent but very kind-hearted guy. Basically, the only thing that makes him idiot is that he isn't cynical, like everyone else in all of Russia. He just takes everyone at face value and believes them, and everyone's like, wow, you idiot. Why would you do that? Everyone is out to get you. <laughs> everyone is a cynical piece of shit nihilist who wants the worst for you. Due to his life experiences and disposition, just doesn't understand that. But no, it's a great book. It has a lot to do with religion versus atheism. 
psychology and morality in these really interesting and enjoyable to read ways. Talks a lot about like Russian national identity, which was like extremely important to the novel. Could have maybe been translated to Japanese national identity, but I don't know. It's a book about a lot of things, even though it just follows this plot. At the end of the day, it's a very good book, and I can see why Kurosawa wanted to adapt it. It has these crazy, over-the-top characters who are really enjoyable, pretty heady interrogation of morality. But also, it's not surprising that it's a hard-to-adapt book. It's very long. Very famously, it doesn't really have a structure. The book just kind of <laughs> that, follows... That explains so much. <laughs> I know. <laughs> It just follows this idiot around as his life pings from person to person and just like event to event. And also famously, when Dostoevsky was writing it, he didn't know where it was going to go. He wrote it chapter by chapter, week by week, intentionally not preparing what it's was like going to happen. <laughs> yeah, 1869 Russian jazz. But it's a it's a great book. If, listener, you are the kind of person who thinks you can get through the idiot, then I would recommend it. I am actually very glad that I read it, even if it's for a bit for one episode of this Without podcast. even reading it, I could probably recommend the book over the movie. <laughs> Oh, I would absolutely recommend the book over the movie. I don't know if I would recommend this movie at all, but we'll, we'll get into it. Let's get into the plot summary. <laughs> Kinji Kamada, a Japanese prisoner of war afflicted with epileptic dementia, returns home to Hokkaido on a train where he meets Denkishi Akama. He is on his way to visit the Ono family, who he shares some relation to. He becomes embroiled in a love triangle between Denkichi and Taiko Nasu, the mistress of a wealthy businessman, and he ends up asking Taiko for her hand in marriage. She abandons him, and he spends several months in Tokyo pining after her. Upon his return, he finds himself falling in love with Ayako Ono, the youngest daughter of the Ono family. Taiko tries to meddle in the affairs of the couple until Ayaka brings them to a confrontation in which Kinji cannot decide between the two. Ayaka flees and refuses to see Kinji again. After time passes, Denkichi takes Kinji to his house where he finds that Denkichi has murdered Taiko. The two men lose sanity through the course of the night as they lay together, hoping not to be discovered. So that is what happens in this movie, and indeed that all does happen in the book with different names and different locations. This film does have a lot of characters. It doesn't have nearly as many characters as the book. And in fact, I think that's one of the weaknesses oh, really? of the film. The ones it does have, Kinji Kameda, who plays the idiot himself, who is based on the character Prince Mishkin, who has a longer name, Leoiv something Mishkin. Every, every character in this book has three names, and they use any one or two of them <laughs> at any given time to refer to them. And then some have nicknames of one of the three names that they will also use without ever mentioning <laughs> that that's their nickname or oh anything like that. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you thought it was rough in this movie, you have oh, no idea. Oh, it's rough in this movie. There is like two of every name. Akama and Ayako, Kameda and Kayama. Which doesn't happen in the book. I don't know why he like gave them paired names. I guess to like further show that they're related in some way, but he didn't get that from the book. That's his own invention. So there's Denkichi Akama, who is based on the character uh, Rogozin, or Rogozin. Not entirely sure I say it's a Russian name. Then there is Taiko Nasu, who is based on Nastasia Filipovna. Which, despite having read that name a thousand times, don't quite it know It wasn't how it's an said. audiobook. And then there is Ayako, who is based on Aglia Ivovna, who is in the book one of three daughters of the family, but in the movie is one of two. Then we have Ono, which is Ayako's father, who is based on General Epanchin, who also has the three names. Then there is Satoko, which is Ayako's mother, who is based on Lizaveta Prokofevna, which is one of my favorite names to read, even though in my head it just sounds like jazz. You can see why they changed the names. <laughs> Tahara, who is based on Tatsuki, who doesn't really matter. And then Matsuo Kayama is based on a character named Gavril Adronovich, and possibly also Yevgeny Pavlovich, but it's unclear. He's mostly based oh, on Oh, so Gavril. he's like two characters in one, kind of? Yeah, they like keep giving him, well, actually, he's oh like three God. or four. But he's mostly based around one character, and then every time a character is missing, they just put it on him, <laughs> uh, as I'll explain. <laughs> yeah. And then there is Takako, who is based on a character named Varya, also Ad Adronovich the sister of Gabriel. Okay, so that's just a few of the characters. Characters missing are Lebdiev, Ippolit, Dodorenko, Keller. <laughs> All these are really important characters <laughs> to the novel that are just not in the movie. <laughs> but whatever, that's what we got. And it's still a lot of characters and it's still One confusing. of my biggest compliments for this movie is the absolute all-star cast that we have here. This is like Kurosawa's Avengers, essentially, of just like every good actor he ever worked with all combining together for this, so... Kameda is played by Masayuki Mori, who was the husband in Rashomon, so it's nice to see him get more of a leading role, where he's more active rather than just being tied to a tree the whole time. Toshiro Mifune shows up again as Akama. Setsuko Hara reprises her role as the Joker, as Taeko. And Takashi Shimura shows up as Mr. Ono. We have a lot of really great talent in front of and behind the scenes. One of the compliments I do have for the film is that it was actually excellently cast. 
all of these actors fit really well for the roles they were put in, with one exception, which is Minoru Chaiki, who plays Matsuo Kayama, based on Gavril. He does, like, not fit the role at all. That guy is supposed to be very intelligent, very narcissistic, but, like, a very, like, capable, forward-thinking Oh, he guy. wasn't written as a simp cuck? He kind of is, but, like, not the way he shows up in the movie. He's, like, a very conniving, intelligent, narcissistic man in the book. The guy does not get it across. He just looks dumb. He just kind of looks like he's being led around by the nose. He uh, absolutely has his own motivations. He knows what's going on. But everyone else was actually very good in the role. They very much so fit good, what you think of. Takashi Shimura is great as the father. The daughter is wonderful. Even Prince Mishkin, Kameda, is good. I think they kind of mess his character up. But, like, it's not his fault. He does a great job. Or maybe job they didn't, game. and we just lost it somewhere in those hundred missing minutes. Maybe. The only way they messed him up is through omission. Maybe, okay, that's maybe the big thing about the film that I want to get into. The thing about Prince Mishkin, and the thing about all these characters, is that even though he's an idiot, he's very intelligent and very eloquent and well-spoken, and he spends the entire book talking. This is a book that's, like, entirely based around dialogue. There's so much dialogue all the time. All they do is talk, and they talk about all these crazy subjects and these themes, and all the themes that the novel has are actually elaborated in conversation between characters. And that just, like, doesn't happen in this movie. <laughs> There's a few, like, important conversations, and other than that, it's, like, nothing. So, Mishkin does... Or, not Mishkin, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna have the tendency to refer to them by their name in the book. Kameda does come across as an idiot, but he's also supposed to be very smart, very well-read, and very charming. And he's supposed to be able to talk really eloquently to everyone, kind of impress everyone with how decorous and good at speaking he is, and he just doesn't say anything in this movie. That whole trend follows where they just didn't have enough time to have all these conversations where you get to know all these characters, and so all the characters felt super underdeveloped. And so did all the themes. That's the biggest thing. I was like, everyone keeps saying, oh, he's actually really cool and intelligent. I'm like, where? We don't see it. He just looks like a simp. <laughs> he's just dead quiet. He doesn't say anything except really just like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> in the book, he does all the same things that he does in the movie, but he also says so much more. He has crazy theories about morality. He has like big opinions on atheism and on Christianity. Oh, one weird thing. You know how he talks about how he was given the death penalty and saved yeah. the last minute? That doesn't happen to his character in the book. That's just a story he heard what? and tells everyone. It doesn't... <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait, so why, why is him. he the quote-unquote idiot He's just epileptic. Is, I... He's just, he just had epilepsy, maybe from... Oh my God. <laughs> he doesn't have epileptic dementia. He just has regular epilepsy, and he had it really bad when he was a kid. So he gets sent to a sanatorium, but he's otherwise So he's not okay. a prisoner of war? No, he was just like a, like a, a prince, like Did a rich prince little Mitch kid. Did Prince Michigan even go to war? Oh Never. my god. No. He's just like a sensitive <laughs> fancy lad who was like really epileptic as a child and then his parents died, so he got shipped off through like a wealthy patron, not through his own parents' money. He was never prisoner of war. He does talk about the situation in which someone gets sentenced to death and then gets commuted, because that actually happened to Fyodor Dostoevsky right, right. himself. I had heard about that. But it doesn't happen to Prince Mishkin at all. He just thinks it's really fascinating and tells everyone he meets about that story. So it's super weird in the movie when he was like, that was me. <laughs> That happened to me, and that's wow. what made me an idiot, which is not, like, at all <laughs> his backstory in the book. In the book, he just was a prince with, like, a bad epilepsy, so he kind of grew up outside of society because he was too Society epileptic. strikes again. So he just, like, doesn't learn manners, and he doesn't learn the cruelty of society because he spent too much of his childhood as this sick kid. He doesn't have, like, dementia in any way. He is just kind of this feverish, sensitive, intelligent young guy who's very naive because of his weird childhood. But yeah, so the major difference. Differences very weird. are expected, and it sounds like the novel itself is very much about Russian society, so by transposing it to Japanese society, it's obviously going to be changes, and maybe there should have been more changes in actually examining Japanese society. I think that definitely would have made it I will say better. that I think transposing this story to Hokkaido, the northernmost island of Japan, is a very smart idea on Kurosawa's part by having it be, you know, the more winter island that's always full of snow, to fit kind of the perception of Russia a little bit better. Also, the people in Hokkaido and in Sapporo, the main city, are a little bit more western, where they do tend to sit on chairs and sit at tables rather than kneeling on tatami. It works a little bit better than it would have worked if this was set in Tokyo instead. That and I think really that the setting is a really good change of pace from everything we've gotten from Kurosawa so far. Yeah, it's no longer blisteringly We've seen our hot. share of sweaty cinema from Stray Dog and Rashomon and Drunken Angel, where everything just looks hot all the time. Mm -hmm. 
And here, you know, now everything is really cold. We're getting all these really nice snowstorms and blizzards and everything. One of the things I can appreciate about this movie is the fact that it at least looks different. Yeah, I'll actually say also it looks good. It looks accurate to if you were translating this novel to a Japanese setting. Visually, I had basically no problems with it. Everything looked right, except for the one character. Everyone looked the way I thought they should. They even did a really good job showing the wealth disparity in housing. They don't really make a big deal out of it. But the Ono family, which is the Apanshin family, is very rich and they live in a nice mansion. And then his assistant, the secretary, does live in like a smaller house. And it's a very big deal in the book. And they, it's very yeah, subtle yeah. what they I mean, show. The, the Ono house is huge. Even though I feel like we pretty much always see it from the inside and not really too much from the outside. You can just tell it, it's It has nicer. like a whole welcoming area. That alone is like... On it. it has stairs. <laughs> it's... Uh, even a commas house that also it's supposed to look that fucked up. It's, it's like, supposed to look like he's squatting line. in an abandoned church. Not exactly that. It's supposed to be very dark and creepy and weird. And I think they do a good job translating that into if that was a Japanese house in this weird place. Visually, it was an impressive adaptation of the text. Doesn't mean it was a good movie. <laughs> From reading Donald Ritchie's analysis of it, he says that, honestly, Kurosawa's problem is that he's so blindly loyal to the source material that he doesn't make the changes that are really necessary to make this story work. Again, Dostoevsky is his favorite author. He says that Dostoevsky writes the most honestly about human existence. I would believe that based he on this one He absolutely book. loves it, and he thinks he kind of almost detaches himself from humanity because he's able to look at it so honestly. Which, you know, after Rashomon is clearly where his head is at about the human's ability to interpret and accept the truth and reality about certain matters. It's no surprise that he's a major influence on him. He just clearly loves this so much that he can't bear to make some of the changes that he needed to, and then those changes wound up being made by the studio and not by him. This is what happens when you fix it in post, people. As a filmmaker, I'll tell you, don't fix it in post, fix it in pre. There's, I saw another line, if you don't mind me reading it, from the Donald Ritchie book, which is, uh, a novel is more than its story, and the film, by insisting upon fidelity, remains only story, reduced to plot, anything which stood in the way of plot had to go. That is 100% my impression from reading the book and watching this movie. The only thing you could get in there was the plot, and then you miss the entire point of the book, which is about everything that happens in between the plot. The plot isn't really that important to the novel. It's all about these characters talking to each other and having little interactions and Michigan like misunderstanding what he should do when he talks to people. And it's all in these conversations and these moments. And it just gets totally flattened when you just go plot to plot, point to point without any of like the important. It's almost in like racing through it. But this movie is almost three hours long. This is the fourth longest Kurosawa movie. So certainly not racing to any conclusions. He is racing through the plot at a snail's pace. He flies by tons of details. There's a few different scenes in which, in a wipe, he'll just skip 100 pages. <laughs> or at one point, he'll, something will happen. It'll reference something that happened 400 pages earlier in the novel, which doesn't make sense to bring up now. At the end, you know how it's weird where the daughter runs away, and then the idiot winds up with Toshiro Mufune, and they go yes, back to the definitely. house? In that time, what happens in the book is that he decides to get married to the woman, the crazy woman. He decides to get married, and they spend like two months preparing for their wedding, and then on the day of their wedding, she flees with Toshiro Mifune's character, and then he kills her, and that's all supposed to happen, and that happens in like one wipe, and oh. they don't say any of it. But that is supposed to happen in there. <laughs> and they mention that time has passed, even though they didn't show it in any way. They're like, yeah, it's been a while <laughs> since one the shot ago. The wipe is used a lot in this movie, and it's used excessively, but often correctly. Yeah, you know, like over. it at least does help to cover the vast amount of time that we're taking because this is another big part of Kurosawa's style. And I don't think this film is going to rate super highly for us, but it does look great, like we said. And there is a visual look and strength to it that doesn't feel like earlier work. It does feel very professional. I think that this is this whole movie is a really weird case of everybody being at the top of their game, being in top form but something isn't clicking. I think it all happened in the script they tried to make from the book. It looks great. And like a lot of the performances were very good, but just like the script, you can tell as you go along, like all of these lines pretty much are taken directly from the book. But because they just kept doing that, you like don't get a script for a movie out of it. And it just doesn't come together. Like each scene felt fine on its own, but then the whole story was probably very confusing and didn't really come together. I absolutely agree, and I, again, I haven't read this, so and I, I've seen this before, and I was still like white knuckling it through parts of this movie because I was so confused. I just spent this whole movie being like, "That's weird. Why would they do that there? Oh, that's weird. Why would they do that there? That's weird. Why is that happening now?" 
every little thing i was like oh this is that this is that that is this even like weird things where you know at the yeah. ice festival which doesn't happen in the book that's that's like four different scenes combined into one the point at which the the crazy lady comes by and like messes with them that's referencing a scene in which she does that to a different character some like nice rich guy who's supposed to marry the daughter instead of Michigan or instead of the idiot Shortly after that, he's like on the bench, which they go to a bench in the book, and he's like, sorry, I couldn't sleep because that character tried to commit suicide. But that character is actually a totally different character who does try to commit suicide in the novel. But after reading like a 40 minute screed about his opinions on life and the universe and his death, the guy was like gonna die from consumption in a week. And he was like, I'm making it my own personal mission to kill myself before that happens. And then he messes up by the gun forgets to load and everyone's like, yeah, dumbass. And then they just get mad at him. They're like, pussy, you won't do it. <laughs> And then for the rest of the novel, he's like, I swear I'm going to do it like any day now. I'm going to kill myself. And everyone's like, yeah, we don't care. All of that was just like totally flattened into, oh, yeah, this other guy who isn't him tried to kill himself last night. So like clearly he wants to like make reference to the book, but it gets so tortured <laughs> in this weird he translation. He clearly knows this book inside and out, but somewhere along the way, something isn't working. I think that the missing footage is a huge, huge problem in this. I believe that. I wish he wrote a letter it. to his mentor, Kajiro Yamamoto of Uma fame and those who make tomorrow infamy. <laughs> Yamamoto said that he had never seen Kurosawa angrier than during the things with this movie because. Yeah, probably because he cared. So much yeah, about it. this is yeah. such a personal project to him. And he said the studio cut so much out of it that he suggested that they cut the film lengthwise instead <laughs> <laughs> because they were just interested in mutilating this film. Uh, that's that's, that's but a sick even line. with all of that. There are points in this movie where I think that it is scenes in their proper order, you know, going one scene to the other, and yet something is still not working. I agree. Uh, one scene that stood out to me, there's a scene early on where the idiot is at the secretary's house. All of a sudden, the crazy woman shows up, and there's this big conflict, and they all start fighting, and then a bunch of other guys show up, and then they get really mad. Uh, Chishiro Mufune shows up. <laughs> okay, first of all, he walks in and says, I'm Dunkichi Akama, and I'm rich <laughs> as hell, <laughs> which is not... That's, that's a, a 10 on the, the hotness book. scale right there. It was so funny. And it is, like, accurate to the character, kind of. Having read the book, that was the funniest thing he could have possibly said walking in there. Which, he, like, he would never have said that in the book. But it was so, I, I'm this guy and I'm rich as hell because that's my function right now. <laughs> Think about that. In the novel, that scene feels very naturalistic, even though it's crazy. Like, everything just keeps flowing one line to the next. There's a lot more dialogue in it. And it all feels very natural. And in the movie, it felt, like, extremely stilted. I was like, oh, this is all just, like, point, point, point. It feels very disconnected. I don't really this know what's going on. This is a weird kind of setup for Kurosawa anyway, because his films are so much about action, but he's taken this book that is all about cold people sitting inside talking, and there's not a lot of movement, there's not a lot of action in the story. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he adds movement where there's none, and it makes it worse. I, could, I thought of like several times in which he adds movement that would not be in the book and it totally fucks it's up just the totally scene. antithetical to the way that he's done a dozen other movies beforehand you know we're going to see scenes like that later on in other movies but he gets better at it and i think learns better ways of doing these sorts of conversations i think he has so many different impulses going at the same time that are just not clicking there's a scene in One Wonderful Sunday where the couple is talking inside and over the course of the conversation, they get mad and angry and start crying and then rain drips into a pan in the middle of the room. And it's just like crazy, really long scene. And that scene is like every single scene in the book. And he pulls it off really well there, but he just like it doesn't come together. He would have to do that every single time the in the movie. The Dostoevsky influence is clear in retrospect on other parts of his work. Like Drunken Angel is a bit like that. Ikiru and Redbeard are really like that. I'm actually excited to see Ikiru in light of having read a Dostoevsky novel. But I just was thinking, I was like, oh, you know, Ikiru is probably going to be a better version oh, of the idiot. Yeah. I do think that it is a style that is evolving, and he will do things like that again and do them a lot better. The beginning of the movie suffers from a lot of Sanshiro Sugata syndrome, where there are walls and walls of text. Oh, yeah, that the was really weird. The first title card is one of the strangest things I've ever seen in a movie, because he... Essentially, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned One Wonderful Sunday. I talked about in that, at the end of that movie, there is a fourth wall break, which is very uncommon for Kurosawa. I said, I don't think he ever does it again. I think he does it here through text. Technically, you could say because that, Because yeah. he acknowledges the author of the movie that we're watching and discusses his motivation like he's writing his college thesis. 
Yeah, he says the classic line. That is like the most famous line about the novel. Even like today, if you look up, what's the idiot about? It says what it says. I think in that it's title wonderful. Part. It says Dostoevsky wanted to portray a genuinely good man. It may seem ironic choosing a young idiot as his hero, but in this world, goodness and idiocy are often equated. The story tells of the destruction of a pure soul by a faithless world. But th- keep in mind that you're not reading that before the movie. You're reading this after a, after yeah, a, a scene, scene, like in the middle of the yeah, scene. Yeah, in, in the in the middle of the scene. They're still on the train yeah, when it's done. And it's so <laughs> yeah. bizarre to have the filmmaker acknowledge the author of the story. It like It's incredibly weird. I read that and I was like, excuse it's me. It's a non-diegetic title card. Whereas all the other title cards that come up are I mean, even they aren't really doing things correctly because a lot of them are giving character background in the way that a book would. Well, actually, that's another interesting thing. This book never does what the title cards do. This book never says the author of the book doesn't come in and say this is the exposition. That entire opening, like everything you learn, even from the title cards about Rogosian, you learn through conversation. They don't give oh, you I anything. Figured that. I think that these are all title cards written after everything is cut and he has to explain everything. Okay, okay. There's that no makes sense. way that this was the intention. Yeah, I was like, all this would be explained in conversation. It's because just not there. <laughs> I think every scene that did explain that stuff is missing. There probably yeah, was a scene of Akama giving his entire background about how he stole the ring and how he's coming in to collect all this money. But because that scene got cut, because they said, oh, we can just turn it into a title card and explain all of it, and it'll save us like five minutes of screen time, and we need to cut 95 more minutes out of the movie. We need to cut an entire Rashomon out of the movie. We're just left with it, and it is so bizarre. And it's later on, I mean, bizarre. they introduce a lot of characters this way. And because so many characters have similar names, and this thing is just racing by to get us back to it, I am so confused. I paused and rewound the first act of this movie countless times because I couldn't keep track of who people were, what their motivations were, because I knew the answers are there because I could have read them if it, if it, if just even if the title card was slower. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so quick that I, I literally did not have enough time to gather it. Luckily, that kind of stops later on, but in this first act, I mean, it is just a mess. The only reason I had any idea what was going on is because every time a character is introduced, I was like, okay, I know who that is. That is this name in the book. That is Gavril. <laughs> that is Varya. And so I already know everything I need to know about them because I read the entire book. I would have no idea I've what was going on. I've seen this before, and I knew how I felt about it already, but I was like, there's at least hope that you, being fresh off the book, might enjoy it more because you'll be able to follow things easier. I at least I knew what was going on. Yeah, I followed everything. That super simultaneously easily. makes it like kind of a good adaptation, but also if it doesn't work on its own, that's a problem. No, it does not make it a good adaptation. Yeah, you don't. You should not have to read this book <laughs> in order to understand read like the basic plot points of the movie. Book. I think it's five hundred and seventy-eight page novel <laughs> to get a, the two and a half hour movie. <laughs> I guess yeah, a four hour movie. That was this is down, three hours that feels like eight hours. Yeah, no, it's very plotting and weird. And they still miss so much. <laughs> like, that was the weirdest thing. They, they would take so long to do something that, like, doesn't even happen. I just keep on talking about the things that happen in the book. At the end, there's that scene where he looks between them, the two women that he has to decide between. And he takes a really yeah. long time to do it. In the book, they're, like, screaming, and it happens, like, immediately. They're like, ah, you, you better come with me. No, you better come with me. He's like, ah, ah, wait. And then because he says wait, she freaks out and leaves. But in the, in the movie, it took, like, two, three minutes. And I was like, that's so weird. What a weird use of time when you need to do other stuff. He spends like a really long time having the idiot freak out when he's worried that Toshiro Mufune is going to stab him. Which like, I don't know if you understood that's what was going on. I knew I knew yeah, that's what was going to happen. It's a big world, but there's not actually a whole lot of people in it. Maybe that's because you said that a lot of characters are consolidated. Even though so Kameda many. is the war veteran, it's Toshiro Mufune that has the killer eyes. And there, there's no doubt that a weapon is going to end up in his hand. And that, that was actually well adapted. The book talks a lot about his eyes. And before the idiot even knows what's going on, that he's being followed, he was like, I keep seeing these eyes in the crowd. I don't know whose they are. But there's a stray dog-like montage to show that he's just freaking out. And was just constantly moving around the city, getting covered in snow, putting his ha- head in his hands. And then, like, it seems like the montage is over because he's just, like, in a cafe and things are fine. And then he sees something in the window and the montage <laughs> starts again. And then it keeps going. <laughs> I was like, this is crazy. And... <laughs> You're telling me they cut the 100 minutes from this movie just to do this? The idiot is a tale of compromise here. 
I at least applaud that the movie starts us off right away with the idiot on the train meeting Akama, and then they see the picture of Taiko. I don't. What, what is that building that her picture is in? It was at a photo studio, which is weird because in the book it's just. I really in his like house. that shot of her in the middle, and then the reflections of both of their faces in the window on opposite sides of it, really directly setting up the dichotomy that's going to come into this relationship. That was really cool. That sets up stuff that you wouldn't even have known. <laughs> like, it otherwise. isn't too, too long before Taiko comes in, played by Tetsuko Hara, yeah, in a crazy outfit where she's in, like, all black. An inverse Miss Havisham, almost. <laughs> yeah, she's supposed to be just an extremely well-dressed woman I mean, she's the times. specter of death. Yeah, and, and which is accurate to her character, but she's just supposed to look really good all the time. And she did not look really she's good all the time. She's literally depressed all the time, like a lot of people do. She's supposed to be so attractive that it literally drives everyone insane. <laughs> so is also the daughter, and she at least looks like Ayako normally. Ayako is around, and there's a mini title card explaining her character as well, which says, Ayako, straight-laced and strong-willed, like her mother. So straight-laced at times that she turns mean. And that's it. I'm like, why did they include that? <laughs> Yeah, that's you could just gather that from looking at yeah, her. From, like, I, I, I watching get that the movie. from her scowl that's almost always on her face. Yeah, for you already met her, and she just did what the title card <laughs> yeah, said. That it's she not even like, in her <laughs> introduction. It's like after like four scenes. It's after she already is mean because she's like her daughter. Yeah, the book makes a big deal about how she's like her mother, but yeah, like you could. Yeah, I don't know. You could. We tell. meander through a lot of character introductions and everything, and eventually we get Taiko's party where she's supposed to accept the uh, dowry for her marriage. Yeah, she's gonna give her decision about whether she's gonna marry this marriage of convenience yeah, and money. Yeah, because she is the mistress of Tohato. Yeah, which I okay. The listeners who have read the book, if there are any, are gonna roast me for this. I didn't actually pick that up from the book, even though it's very <laughs> obvious in the book. I didn't realize that she was being kept like that. And then when I saw the movie, I was like, oh, that makes like a lot of things make more sense. I still, yeah, yeah You I heard know. it here first. <laughs> Superior adaptation. But I do drive it home a lot clearer by having every character be like, look at that mistress of yeah, that man. Yeah, I thought man. the whole point of the dowry was for it to be secret. Every single person knows about it. Yeah, it was a little weird. There's one fire line where... It's weird in the, in the movie because she takes very sincerely to the idiot telling her like how wonderful she is. Where in the book, she's like just very sardonic and annoying or just like sardonic and like mean to him. So in the movie, you see the point where she's like, oh, my whole life has been ruined because that man did awful things to me. And everyone's like, oh, and then he like runs out. In the book, that doesn't she never says that. It's all very cordial until the very end. She's like, oh, I wouldn't marry this idiot. I would never do that to a child. I don't like children. If you want to know someone who likes children, you should look at that guy. <laughs> like calling him out as a pedophile. I was like, whoa. <laughs> Akama is coming in with his giant brick of one million yen to not pay her, but to pay Kayama, who was going to receive the dowry of 600,000 yen. Akama is now going to give him a million yen to not marry this girl so he can do it instead. But then she also becomes enamored with the idiot and then suddenly decides, oh, no, I'm I'm not going to do it because I, I don't want to hurt him. So then she winds up going with him anyway, but throws again, pulls a Heath Ledger move and throws the cash into the fire throws it in the fire watch it all burn <laughs> which is all yeah that all happens and that's it's great i thought it was, yeah, it was really that's fun the best scene in the movie truthfully i think it's the scene where yeah. i understand the most and like feel the tension and i find the i mean just and, and honestly any scene of just chucking that much money into a fire is always gonna resonate a bit so i i found that to be a very impactful moment and i and i think the performances again are really really great and i really like seeing setsuko hara do this Again, this is her only other collaboration with Kurosawa besides No Regrets for Our Youth, and I love that he's giving her different roles than she would really be known for, like in Ozu movies or in Naruse movies. Yeah, this character's supposed to be crazy. No, she she's nuts. Job. <laughs> They're all nuts. Every single character in this movie is insane. Yeah, that's a common criticism of the novel, too. That's I must all have missed the title card where they explain that. She was supposed to be meaner and more crazy and more insane and more sarcastic, but she, you know, did yeah, her well, best. Yeah, well, maybe she was, but I mean, I think another big problem with this is that she disappears from so much of the movie, and she is easily my favorite part of it. After she leaves with Akama, she isn't really seen again until the ice festival. We hear, you know, through, I think, some text or some hearsay that they've been seeing each other occasionally and she keeps bouncing man to man, but we don't really get a good sense of it. And it always feels like she's Akama's girl. 
I will defend Kurosawa here. In the book, what happens is she runs off, and then also it skips to after all of that stuff happens. It skips to the same point in time really? that it does in the movie, and you just hear about it happening. It's very weird in the book, pages, too. and they had nothing about that. You, uh, literally, the rest of the book is them talking about what happened in those uh. six months. But, like, you don't see it either in the book. So, it, like, he is just being faithful there, but it also it comes across weird. But what happens is they talk about it all the time in the book, and they just don't talk about it that much in the movie. Whereas, like, basically all they do is excavate those six months where the idiot Akama and Tatsukahara are having this tryst in Tokyo it's or tough. Moscow. I mean, that's the thing with an adaptation is that movies are show, don't tell. A book can tell. But here we really need to see it. It feels cheap and it makes it really confusing. I, I mean, so much of this movie's confusing. All I can defend him is by saying he was being faithful, but then he didn't do anything. That is good to know, but it is still a problem. Oh, yeah. I feel no, terrible because sure. I don't want to trash Kurosawa, but part of being a fan is to be critical. I know that this isn't entirely his fault, but all we have to judge is the movie itself. At the end of the day, no matter what happened, the movie is all that exists. The movie is all that remains. And it's very flawed. Even with 100 minutes added to this, I could still see some stuff that just like wouldn't come across the way it's supposed to or come across Definitely. right, I think. They do this weird thing with Toshiro Mifune's character where he's this like bad boy in like a leather jacket and he's cool and he smokes cigars, which isn't right, <laughs> but it's fine. It's like, that's a, I'm okay with that interpretation of the character. It makes sense. But then you go to his house and his house is like this creepy abandoned death chamber. Which is what happens in the book, and I'm like, but now, now it doesn't mesh right, because you're taking his actual house from the book with, like, this new character you've invented for him, and it doesn't, Donald like, make Richie any sense. had another really good quote in his analysis of this, where he said, He did nothing at all towards adapting the characters to their Japanese milieu. They exist just as they do in the novel, except that they consequently appear misplaced. I think that's true, yeah. They even say the exact same words they say in the novel. Yeah, also, a big part of the novel is the fact that this prince is royalty. Oh no, Takashi Shimori's character is a general in the military, and Toshiro Mifune's character is a merchant, and, like, all these class relations are really important to the way it all It's, like, extremely important, in fact. It's all about class relations, and that just, like, doesn't really come across at all. Which is why it's so wild that Satsuka Hara's character is this kept woman. She's this, like, totally classless urchin, essentially, who is breaking into these upper-class circles and Yeah, but that, that's havoc. not happening. She's, like, more upper-class than a lot of other characters, even though she's being kept. She's supposed to look that way, but they're all, the other characters are supposed to be higher class, so you can tell, like, what's going on, but they're just not. Takashi Shimura's character is rich, and the other guys are rich, but then it just says, like, doesn't, you don't get any of it. There's no aristocrats, which are, like, a big part of the novel, the fact that some people are royalty and some people aren't, and all of that just, like, totally, like, because he doesn't adapt them to a Japanese milieu and doesn't try and find analogies that would make sense, it just doesn't work. Because, I mean, the whole thing's about There's Russian no society. Equivalent. It obviously can't be about Russian society if it's in Japanese society, but it's not about Japanese society either. You could do something, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's about the ideal, which is no society. This is a tough movie to really go beat by beat through like we do for a lot of the other ones, especially Rashomon has an extremely obvious structure, which made it very easy for us to be like, let's examine it now like this, now like this, now like this. But here, I feel like it's so much just having this conversation here, and now we're having this conversation here, and... Yeah, I mean, it's the same issues come up it's over and over again. It's just a lot of talking, but I don't feel like there's anything that's really happening. Yeah. There's no reason for it to be split into part one I think that's just two. a remnant from having it be two movies initially. I think that probably oh, okay. would have been the subtitle, like, The Idiot, Love and Agony, and then The Idiot, Love and Loathing. They could have even removed The Idiot from the title entirely if they were just trying to sell it as two different movies. Do we have any specific moments to really hit on before we get to the end? I don't really have anything that stands out. The Winter Festival that's is strange. That's when Taiko comes back with a comma. Taiko comes back, which is, I hate to keep referencing the book. In the book, she drives by in a carriage and just, like, yells at the idiot oh, and all his friends. To she totally, well, there's this guy there, Yveni Pavlich, who isn't in the movie, who is who the secretary gets conflated with. And he is supposed to be the guy that the young daughter is going to marry. He's, like, this charming upper-class guy who comes in and is going to marry Aglia. And then she, like, totally just swims by and she's like, oh, by the way, all, all that money you owe Rogozin, don't worry about it, wink, and then, like, drives off. And everyone's like, what the fuck? And that's what they're trying to imitate here in the Winter Festival, but it doesn't make any sense, like, because none of that is I do is going really on. like the way that the Winter Festival ends, where it's just this chaotic people skating all around with lit torches and carnival music. It was very cool. I was like, I don't really know what's going on, but this is wild. I like it. The closest parallel in that is that they go to a concert at a park, which I think is what that's supposed I've to reference. I've been to Sapporo before, and they do have the ice festival, so I wasn't sure if it might just be a 50s ice festival happening up there. I feel like I saw some sculptures or something in the background. 
they kept talking about the sculpture. I don't know. It was just like a big dragon. Like I said, that all takes place in summertime in the book <laughs> and their go. I definitely did instead. not guess that. I imagined it all to be just totally ice cold. No, it's like nice out. And they're like, oh, man, it's so nice out. It doesn't make you feel alive. <laughs> not not here. There's very little to feel That's alive That's one about. direct piece of dialogue that didn't make the transition. Yeah. The scene where he buys her red flowers in black and white. First of all, he doesn't buy her flowers in the book, or if he does, it doesn't matter at all. Second of all, the whole discussion about red carnations and what they mean is a reference to the party where she freaks out earlier in the movie. Where at the party, they play this game where they all reveal the worst thing they've ever done. And the rich guy who owns her tells this long story about how this guy really wanted to buy red carnations for this woman. But then he swooped in and bought all the red carnations so he couldn't do it. And he was like, haha, that's like the worst thing I've ever done. It made this guy really upset and then he killed himself. <laughs> Which happens like a lot. Wow, it'd be like that over there. So, like, they bring up the red carnations, and they're also like, yeah, and it's also weird because we don't have flower symbolism in Japan. And I was like, this is the strangest reference ever. That happens, like, 300 pages earlier with different people. But it's clearly still a reference to the book. He still, like, is trying to, like, bring in stuff in the book, but, like, it He's was insane. He's desperate to get some some reference in there. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? That party scene may have existed and then been totally cut. I mean, maybe. that I was, like, just losing my mind as I was watching this movie. Like, what is he, he what's going quotes. on? I guess his really distant cousin, Ayako, I was watching the movie and I texted you during it. I like paused it. I looked up who Ayako is in the novel and was like, is this character related to Prince Mishkin? <laughs> Just totally out of the blue. And you were like, uh. <laughs> so I, te I texted you, no. And then I thought about it and I was like, wait, <laughs> yeah. Because I, I forgot. Was just like, wait a minute. Isn't the reason that they're always together because they're family? <laughs> Just to say what happens in the book. In the movie, they, like, know he's coming and they, like, prepared a room for him or whatever. In the book, he shows up unannounced. He sent them a letter that he didn't get a response to and then shows up and he's like, hey, I'm here. I want to talk to them. And they're like, who the fuck are you? And then the mother's like, oh, yeah, you are, like, vaguely related to someone on one side of my family somewhere. So it's a very distant relationship to the mother. And then in the movie, they're just like, yeah, that's I our relative. I think that she's, like, his cousin. Because isn't she Ono's daughter? And Ono is his uncle. She is Ono's daughter. He's not supposed to be related to Ono at all. He's supposed to be related to the mother. And even that oh. is supposed to be like fourth on removed, whatever. It's supposed to be very distant, but they just don't talk about it. So they just say, oh, he's really, he's not the nephew at all. He's like a very distant relation by like aristocratic name is the thing. The Mishkin name is related to the mother's oh, maiden name. And he said name. something earlier about inbreeding was that that was like his. That's not super implied. It's just because they're aristocrats. You don't really know why he's epileptic. You just know he comes from a very long and storied lineage in Russia that's now, like, out of fashion. Like, there's no one really left besides, like, him and the mother. They're, like, the only two left in this long lineage, and there's not really any money left or any prestige, but they used to be really important. And he's just, like, he's epileptic and his parents he's died He's kind of early courting on. her after almost being killed by Akama. I feel like that assassination attempt shocks him into loving his cousin. You could say that. It definitely shocks them into an they epileptic thing. They spent time fit. together before that. It kind of just seems more like a friendship. Actually, you know what I will say? The movie does a better job showing their courtship than the book, because in the book, they're just kind of in love at some point. And, well, I don't know. It, it's confusing because everyone in this movie is very sincere to him, where everyone in the book is extremely sarcastic to him. Like, Aglia, the daughter, never admits that she's in love with him, like, ever. She just kind of is. And she keeps saying, no, that's not true. I hate this, like, Everyone in idiot. this movie is, like talks to him for a couple minutes and then their heart just melts to him like it's a baby puppy or something like akama wants to kill him at one point and he says like i hate you but i can't hate you anymore after i spend a couple minutes with you that's yes that does happen and that happens in the book too but in the book it makes sense because he's extremely charming and says really nice and charming things to everyone where in the movie he just kind of looks at them with his puppy dog face and say anything whereas in the book he's like oh my god i trust you so much thank you so much for having me like all these kind of things where he just like he very sincerely believes in everyone and all their personal goings-ons which you know more about but that, that is a holdover from the book where everyone loves him even though they hate him even though they love him and the, the dialogue where like the mother says man i hope that kid falls then he falls and she's like oh no I'm, <laughs> i hope he's okay <laughs> that is definitely like emblematic of just yeah, the fact that, uh, they were gonna cut everything and they didn't cut that <laughs> like... yeah it was so funny there was, like, funny moments that weren't in the book. When he pours the shot and he pulls the glass away and just pours it on the table. That's just, like, something he, he made up He stood his fun. ground on the humor in a Dostoevsky adaptation. The one time he did it that was fucked up was this the This love triangle turns into, like, a love square. Ayako and Kanmeda are now a thing, and Akama and Taiko are begrudgingly a thing, I guess. 
he's just crazy in love with her and she's yeah, just and crazy. Yeah, they arrange this diplomatic meeting between the relationships like it's like a high school clique. They do, which it happens. It happens differently, but it happens. This famous final Taiko confrontation. Taiko just wants to fight Ayako for Kameda for some reason. Taiko had been sending letters to Ayako like this whole entire time. And these letters are like, Please marry the idiot. I really want you to. That would make me happy. And if you do that, I'll marry a comma and we'll all, we'll all be happy. Yeah, that's ad- ad- adapted from the book. That all happens. One weird detail he left out is that in the book, in the letter, she says that she loves the daughter. The crazy woman loves the daughter. She says that. And everyone's huh. like, oh, that's weird. She's like, I love you. I just, I'm obsessed with you. I really want you to marry him, though, because I love you. So they she just wants Kameda that. to choose. He can't do it. Ayako kind of like presses him on it. And he's like, I feel so bad. He says to Ayako not to be mad, but Taiko seems so deeply unhappy, and then she just runs out because she interprets that the way I would interpret that. It's not you, it's me, but that still means we're gonna break up or something, even though that doesn't seem to be what he was actually going to do. I think he was just being so open with his heart that it hurt her and she ran away. Well, yeah, his Christian goodness ruined everything in the end. You're rightfully confused because it's confusing. The same thing happens in the book like that's a lot handled of things, better. Evidently. It's extremely tense and they're like yelling at each other and Toshiro Mifune's character has already left. She says get out and she's like you have to decide right now between me or her and the daughter is at the door and the crazy woman is in like a lot of pain. All the idiot is going to do and like it says kind of like you like know what he's thinking. He's, he's just going to say like please don't blame her for this. She's clearly mad and in a lot of pain and then he's going to go with the daughter. But because he hesitates for a moment it says like a moment's hesitation was too much and she fled. But that doesn't work if it's, like, He tries slow. to run after her, Taiko stops him, and then passes out in his arms, as she likes to do, I guess. And so Akama's like, oh, go after her, I'll stay here with her. And then off screen, after splashing a pot of water in her face... Yeah, which is an invention, that doesn't happen. But... He <laughs> kills her off screen, Kameda comes back, and Akama's just going nuts. So like I said, there's supposed to be this long period in which they're going to get married, the idiot and the woman in that time. And then on the day of the wedding, she runs away with him and then he kills her that day. Whatever. And the movie just kind of happens in this indeterminate period of time in between. It looks like it happens like right after. I think it's supposed to be implied that it happens like a few days later. I thought it was like pretty soon after. I didn't think much time had passed, but I don't know. A title card might have helped. They mentioned something about time passing, I thought. It's definitely not more than like a day. Akama does stab Taiko. The idiot's supposed to spend the whole day looking for him, which they say. He's like, oh, I was looking for you. And he's like, follow me. And don't follow oh, me too right. close. Okay, so then, yeah, some time did definitely pass. Yeah, this is a very weird scene in the book, too. It was a and shocking And I think it's ending. a good scene here. I think it's very yeah. effective that Kurosawa doesn't show us Taiko's body. It's just behind this curtain. Akama's looking nuts. Kameda comes in and kind of comes out looking just like him after he sees what the man has done to her. They both, like, I think make some sort of altar to her and wrap up in a blanket together in a beautiful shot. And would you believe that in Alexander Jacoby's A Critical Handbook of Japanese Film Directors, that that is the frame he uses for Kurosawa? Man who has created some of the most iconic (laughs) screen images ever. That is the one still that he chose out of his entire 30 film filmography. Like, I can't believe it's not, like... Ikiru with the swing or something in Rashomon or a seven samurai frame or the Ron temple burning or anything. It's that. Yeah, especially now, like in context, it's just like, why? Actually, it's a very well lit frame. But in the grand scheme of things, if you're just giving a general overview of his work, this is the one that you're going to show. I have like a lot of things to say about this scene. He, like, does little things that he didn't need to do to make the adaptation worse. The idiot asks, is she sleeping over there? And then uh, Kama says, yeah. Whereas in the book, he just says, is she here? And he's like, yeah, she's here. She's yeah, over there. It's being phrased in a way that doesn't implicate it, but... Yeah. Why would he say, hey, is she sleeping? The only thing you see, she's, like, behind a curtain, and then you see her entire body wrapped up with one foot out from under a blanket, and he says it looks like a marble statue, because her foot's so pale. And I thought that was, like, a beautiful frame they could have done. But I guess it would have been scary. Instead, he goes behind the curtain, he screams, then he gets caught in the curtain comedically for like a minute. And it's so weird. I was like, oh my god, this is like the dark emotional climax of the film. And he just gets caught behind the curtain in like a gag. He's an idiot. <laughs> He's not supposed to be an idiot though. He's just kind. 
he's just the ideal embodiment of Christian love, but he gets caught behind the curtain and like comes out and they don't mention that she's dead, but you learn that he stabbed her. And then the knife is like a much bigger symbol in the book, but they try to make it a symbol yeah, in the movie too. Yeah, they up occasionally. Like there's one point where Kameda is hanging out in Akama's house and he like grabs the knife and <laughs> Toshiro Mifune's eyes are just bugging out watching him pick that up. <laughs> It's extremely funny, because that does happen. Like, there's lab scenes which are reported 100% faithfully, and they're just so funny in real life. I, I think they're supposed to be. Like, it was good. He says this weird thing where he's like, now no one else will have her. It's, like, kind of implied. He has this habit of putting a character's, like, motivation into their mouth where it would be more subtle. I guess just for, like, the sake of the script economy. There is no brevity. script economy in this. I'm sorry. The script economy in this movie is in a deep recession. <laughs> That was uh, just a lot of weird things where, like, someone will say their motivation, what you're supposed to know about their character, they'll just say it instead of being implied through tons and tons of small, subtle implications. They lay down directly next to her on the floor in the book instead of somewhere else in the room, and they just, like, lay still together as all the things that happen in the movie happen instead of, like, moving around. That's the only difference is, oh, he mentions, like, why don't you turn the stove on? He's like, because people will see, where in the book is like, why don't you turn a candle on? Because people will see, but in the movie there is a candle on. I think it's, like, maybe a joke for the reader. <laughs> But a very bizarre scene, as it's supposed to be, where they kind of freak out. You, you learn that Toshiro Mifune's character has a brain fever, which caused him to do all this Sus. violence. But he doesn't get acquitted. He gets sentenced to 15 years of labor in Siberia, which they just kind of ignore. And then we get that blog, which is accurate. They do a very subtle job explaining it in the movie, but what happens is the idiot seeing all this gets extremely epileptic again. Basically doesn't recognize him, and he becomes like totally mentally impaired. He's supposed to go back to Sweden in the book, or just goes back to wherever he was being treated. Here for they his just kind of go crazy together. Yeah, they go crazy together, which is accurate. But then, like, you see the epilogue where they're like, "Oh man, shame what happened to him, our little idiot." And then, in the craziest line in the entire movie, the daughter says, "Maybe I was the idiot all along." <laughs> the idiot is the friends we made along the way. That was insane in the movie, but in his defense, they do do that in the book, but for a different <laughs> character. That's how to describe Toshiro Mufune's character, because what happens is the police break in, and Toshiro Mufune's character is just, like, screaming, freaking out, like, writhing on the floor. What the idiot thinks is, like, man, if my doctor, who treated me for my epilepsy, saw him right now, he would shake him and say, he's an idiot. <laughs> and that's, like, the little button on the end of the book. So they do it again, but with, like, a different character, which is, like, extremely yeah, wild. And then after 19 hours of watching the end title... Yep. What so was your it. favorite shot in all of this? Anything that really captured Dostoevsky's prose? Uh, yeah, actually. Like I said, he does a good visual job. I was picking between two. I really like the ending shot of that crazy scene where they both fall over and they look crazy and dead because of the insane lighting. But I didn't pick that one because I didn't really have anything to say about that. It was just cool. Uh, the one I picked was this scene which happens after the idiot and Akama talk and they have this like kind of reconciliation. The idiot's leaving. Akama refuses to shake the idiot's hand and like kind of starts freaking out and then runs back to his door and looks out the window and then it zooms in on his eyes. So my shot is of Toshiro Mifune's eyes looking extremely angry in this little box. This character's eyes are like a huge motif in the book. He's always stalking people, and people always see his eyes in the crowd, and they're supposed to be these really, like, disconcerting, dark... It, is, it really upsets everyone, and not just the idiot, it upsets other characters too. So the fact that he, like, showed this through this crazy, like, cut-up to just his eyes in frame, I was like, oh, it's a really good way to adapt this kind of feeling of his eyes or this intense That's feature. nice to see something that literary be able to be adapted. And for mine, I chose near the end when they're having the uh, couples conference. It's of Taiko on the ground next to the heater or the stove. I'm not sure exactly what it is. And she's just so angry and upset with absolutely everything. There's a point where there's a gust of wind and it sends air down the shaft into the fire and it makes the entire thing flame up and smoke. And it's such a nice externalization of her just simmering with anger. We've seen Kurosawa use all sorts of different weather techniques. I felt like even though we had a lot of snow here, I felt like there wasn't as much of it consciously. It just kind of felt more like the environment. But here we're seeing him do it with fire, which is very cool. We've seen him do it with, I think, every element except fire. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that's This was like the choice. one frame I did already know from this movie, and I kind of forgot about it until the very end. I spent the whole time being like, this movie is well shot. Nothing is really standing out to me because there aren't really any crazy moves or anything. It's so much of it is just locked down in rooms. But this is a really nice little moment that sells everything. And I mean, this is what's going to cause her to die. Her seething anger has never felt stronger, I think, than in this moment. You know who else is burning hot? 
The Toshiro Mufune? Toshiro yeah. Mufune is awful cold in this movie, wearing many, many coats. Yep, and here we will have some disagreement, but why don't you say your opinion on the Toshiro Mufune hotness scale I'll for the idiot? I'll throw the uh, 9.2 on, just because he's always kind of dressed up like that, and it's kind of a dick. I wouldn't ever want to be around this guy. Okay, okay. Like I said, I thought all the casting was good. I thought Toshiro Mufune did a great job in this crazy role of this crazy character. My one complaint, actually, was that he looked a little too good. I'm giving him a 9.7. I thought he looked really hot <laughs> in this movie. When he wasn't really supposed to, he looked really cool smoking cigars for no reason. He was wearing a leather jacket. He walks in and he says, I'm a common, I'm rich as hell. And I was like, damn, he's like really good looking Yeah, I, I take it back. 10.2. <laughs> I think for our final ratings for the movie, if you couldn't already tell from however long this conversation has been, it's just a big whiff. Like, <laughs> yeah, it really just is. Especially the fact that this is in between Rashomon and Akiru, two of his Akira, biggest... That's- most incredible, incredible yeah. films and honestly i feel like there's a lot of his movies where we're, it's like one or two really great ones and then it's one that no one ever watches or is really heard of and i don't know if that necessarily always translates to them being bad but i think just maybe ones that don't resonate quite as much or just aren't him at top form as he is for so much of the 50s and the first half of the 60s this film i think gets by on a lot of technical stuff because again we said it's really well shot I think the music is good here, and I really like the sound mixing. There's a few moments where, like, the idiot is telling his story, and where he's talking about the firing squad, and, you know, oh, we like, yeah, hear yeah. the sounds of, like, the guns go off and everything, and a poignant moment where he kind of gets shocked into a little bit of a stupor. There's a lot of good moments like that. There's a lot of good scenes sprinkled throughout this movie, and the cast is great. Any adaptation that does faithfully adapt its source material, even if it doesn't always work, I think being faithful is a big part of an adaptation. I do at least like to hear that so much of it is, even if it loses a lot of it, which was always going to happen. I mean, tackling a film like this is extremely difficult, and we'll see him tackle other amazing monumental pieces of literature and do it really successfully and totally knock it out of the park. But here, every artist makes mistakes, and unfortunately this is one of them. I'm hitting it with a 5 out of 10, 2.5 stars, 2 stars on your 4 star scale that I hate. Yeah, two stars on the four-star scale. I will also say five out of ten for editing purposes. <laughs> Agree 100%. Five on the strength of the acting, some of the scenes, and the cinematography, but just does not come together Even with movie. this being a rewatch for me, and this being an adaptation of a book that you now know and like, for you, it still isn't working for us. And that, that's just a shame, but you know what? We have a whole lot of other movies to pick from, and we got a better Dostoevsky movie next week with Ikiru, another one of his most important and greatest works. I love this one. I've seen it a lot. Always makes me want to cry. I'm extremely excited. We're really hitting a major streak, which I think we'll have a few interesting misses or not as good films, but we got a lot of greatness coming. So thank you so much for joining us for Sanchiro's Boys Book Club. (laughs) 